the first one being given by Professor Ido Carmina from Technion. And just to give a brief introduction of Ido, I think it's fair to say that Ido has really in very short time made a, a name for himself in, in free electron optics, but in fact working on much broader topics also. And I think it's really a pleasure to have Ido here introducing all of us to this very exciting topic. So please, Ido. Well, oh, okay, now I think you can hear me. It's too loud or it's okay? Okay, so we go with this. So good morning. Thank you for uh, waking up and coming. I see people are still flying. Um, I think before I go into the, in, into the talk and anything about it, I, I just want to say in a, in a few words that uh, for me this is actually the first conference I, I get to since uh, October 7. And I'm, I'm happy to, hear, to be here. I'm maybe doubly happy to be here in some sense. It's, I, I think you all know that we've been in Israel through some horrible events. And uh, even if the situation now is somewhat more stable, it's still pretty bad. Um, I think we all hope for, for better days there. Uh, for, for science in Israel, this is a really complicated time. And I think that it's really important for me here to be saying that science in Israel still stands. And we are really working hard to make it go back to, to move on. It's, uh, it's non-trivial. And I think we are... I'm here because I, I think it's important that we go back to, to conferences. That I, I hope you'll be seeing more Israeli scientists participating in events and in conferences. Um, you should know that at this time, your Israeli colleagues and friends need you the most. And for the next couple of months, it's probably going to be very important to have uh, support and help because it's, it's not easy to do science these days, but we, we work for it. And uh, I think this is why I'm, I'm here and I'm going to into the talk and go through the very important science that I think we're, we're all doing, and I, I want to show how electrons connect to it. So I'll go right into it, and um, I'll also uh, start by saying, may, maybe more broadly than, than regular, being a plenary talk, that you know when we think about free electron science and free electron physics, uh, this is a, a field that has been going for many years. The first reaction people have when we talk about electrons is to, to think about uh, you know, electron accelerators, synchrotrons, free electron lasers, um, for people that are familiar with traveling wave tubes, um, methods for uh, sources of uh, radio frequency waves, uh, microwave ovens. This is the stuff that uh, is typically associated with electrons. Um, but still, somehow, something changed over the last maybe 10, 15 years, and this became um, a, a really renewed field in many aspects. And that's because of a, a series of theory concepts, part of them connected, connecting electrons to photonics, and some of this is thanks to experiments. Um, and if you think about maybe the most famous types of experiments that are now being pursued in our community are electron microscopes, and you can see this also in, a, you know, in, in, my, uh, in my slide here, as a, this is a photo from our lab, that there are now multiple types of electron microscopes that are being used in this field, and really renovated and we need, created new ideas for how we, we do electron science. And you can see this actually in multiple uh, talks and, and groups around our community. From, uh, for example, uh, Marin Soliatic gave a talk yesterday about uh, different types of electron microscopes. Uh, Nikolai uh, Zeludev also has a system of this type. And there are more and more groups in our community that are adopting the use of electron microscopes for experiments that bring this new particle to the field of photonics. So what really make free electron science renewed in, it, in interest. I think part of it is this re really interesting connection to the field we have here, to the different fields of photonics. We see many connections to nanophotonics, to quantum optics, to light matter interactions of various kinds. We are uh, looking at electron interactions now with 2D materials and with polaritons, and I'll bring you examples of all of those. Um, and even with ultrafast science, ultrafast science uh, bringing electrons to the attosecond regime, and the, all of those are now happening and are, I think are part of the reason this field is flourishing. Another um, the thing that we are now doing in, in this context, uh, we uh, submitted to Clio, and there is going to be in the coming uh, Clio, a special symposium called Photonics Meet uh, Free Electron Science that will also you know, introduce many of those aspects in the field. So I think those connections will grow, and it's part of what I find really exciting about this, uh, about this area. Um, so now, with this, let me jump right in and, and say that when I think about the uh, foundations of free electron physics and the concepts that are there, we typically think about electron radiation and electron microscopy. 
And what's, uh, I think, uh, two examples of how this is now evolving is, for example, when we t take, uh, we took Van der Waals materials, this is one of the first experiments from my lab. Um, if you, Van der Waals materials, we showed our excellent platforms to modulate electrons in a periodic fashion and produce X-rays. This was the first example of a mechanism for compact tunable uh, radiation that you can tune by this crystal structure. So this is, a, I think, a really nice example of how modern materials can be part of electron science. On the other side, when you think about microscopy, maybe what got the most famous in our community is this use of electrons to image light and not just metal. So for example, this is a work when we can look into photonic block modes and map the field of photonic block modes in photonic crystals. We then took it a step further and looked into polaritons. This is a, when you have a, a phonon polariton propagating in a flake, you can excite it at the edge and then look at a wave packet moving inside. And this is something we can now do through using the electrons to image something in space and time. Um, and I'll show you a few examples of this. Um, but maybe the um, other aspect of electron science that did not exist in the past and is now becoming of greater interest is this idea that you can act back on the electron and do manipulations on it. And I really like that side of thinking about how we can sculpture, shape the electron wave packets. And that's something we're now doing in, in multiple manners. The majority are based on laser science that to, to manipulate it. And what you can think about is the electron now is as a, as a wave packet that has this behavior that it's maybe a couple of hundreds of femtoseconds long, but it has a, a structure inside that is on the scale of a single femto and even sub femto. Um, and we, it's easier to measure it, although it's not our only way, but easier to measure it in the energy domain. So what you have here is an, the energy axis of the electron relative to its initial energy, and you can see that it's exactly a superposition of those discrete comp. So that is what we think about as an electron comb that we use quite a lot now for, for different applications. Okay, so those are kind of the, the basic building blocks, and I think what has been happening this year, and is maybe the, the, really the frontier right now, is that we start using those electron combs for various applications. And I'll touch some of this in the next uh, couple of slides. So where um, my talk is, is going, Next, I want to try to bring the basic concepts that are now the foundations of this uh, electron quantum optics uh, field. I want to talk about what's happening in my lab over the last year and a bit of the broader context, and then talk, try to predict a little bit of what's going, coming next. And then um, I'll, I'll use, this is a slide that maybe you saw me using before, and I want to bring a new twist on it. When we think about what was, uh, you know, the, the basics of electron and electron light interactions over the last couple of years is, uh, Maybe the most important thing that happened over maybe about 10, 15 years ago, and Javier Garcia de Abajo was, I think, the one to, to crack this problem, is the following idea. If you have an electron interaction with an electromagnetic field, uh, you would normally, old-fashioned style, think about it as a Lorentz force predicting its dynamics, then the energy of that electron will be shifting by some amount, and that is what you would normally expect to see in the lab, then the electron was accelerated or decelerated by the field. But what we actually see in experiments, and this is, for example, from the Gottinger group, from Klaus Hoppers, is this superposition of electron energy levels. And this is, the, you know, when I, this is something shouting quantum very strongly. You see a superposition state, you see a discrete nature here, and an h-bar omega is exactly the gap between the photon energy, electron energies, right? absorbing or emitting individual number of photons. That is really a, like the first example that was shouting quantum to describe what's happening here the typical uh, thing you need to do is take a Schrodinger equation and solve it for the free, free electron. And that's because if you think about the condition for this, you need to have uh, an electron that is, you need to know that the electron itself is bigger than the cycle of the electromagnetic field. Right? The electron at the same time experiences both a field that pushes it up and down, and this oscillatory, this extended nature of the electron relative to the cycle of the electromagnetic field is what really forces us to use a Schrodinger equation. But now, what, what changed? Because this is, you know, the theory behind this is Javier's work from 2010. And this is really what pushed the field to what we think about a, the first quantum revolution for free electrons. But now, what is happening over the last few years, and I think it's quite interesting, is also a, a change in, in way of thinking. If uh, when, you know, I started my group a couple of years ago, we were all into solving partial differential equations like Schrodinger. Now, our students barely do this anymore, and you can really convert this way of thinking to start describing electrons in a, what we'll today think about as quantum optical terminology or quantum information science language. For example, apply operators for the interaction of the electron. You can show that the entire interaction here can be described by a unitary 
operator with new sets of, uh, of uh, those are like uh, in increasing the electron energy or decreasing the electron energy operators. And it is a language that helps us, us think about electron experiments in the language of what we can think about as quantum circuits. Now, it's, it became fashionable, so you can see how people get drawn to it, but what I got convinced in recent years is that it's actually also useful. It actually helps us design experiments and, and explain what's happening there in a more convenient way. And you'll see this coming back in the next couple of slides. So uh, in this slide, I want to then bring the electron in, in, as a quantum particle and talk about it in the following context. You're familiar with maybe the two most famous quantum particles will be the two-level system, right, the qubit, the fermion, the Josephson junction, or the uh, harmonic oscillator, being the boson, the phonon, the photon. Right? But the electron is actually a, a, a particle that you can introduce in a similar fashion. You can think about, through its interaction, it will exchange energy in, energy in a discrete manner. And that, when that happens, you can think about it as a ladder that is two-sided. It's energetic enough, so you can actually go down the ladder a large enough number of times that you can actually think about it as an infinite ladder. And then you have operators to take it up and down, and you have a commutation relations for it that are actually simpler than others. And that, the creature actually has a name. It's called the quantum auto in the quantum information science uh, terminology. And it's a really elegant way to implement that creature. And then, now, thinking about the fact that the electron is just another particle in this kind of plethora of quantum elements, it makes it, it's, I think, very useful to try to kind of classify everything we're doing in a triangle. You know, a typical light matter interactions, and the majority of theory built for quantum computing these days is something on the edge here, between the two-level system and the quantum harmonic oscillator. Right, that's the James Cummings Hamiltonian that will be uh, describing the interaction here. But in a similar way, you can have the interaction between the electron and the quantum harmonic oscillator. And there will be an Hamiltonian of a similar type to describe it. Based on this Hamiltonian, you can actually explain the kind of experiment I showed you before, the electron-light interaction. And this is what we now call photon-induced near-field electron microscopy. Funnily, it was, uh, it was coined by Zewell, because he was thinking about it as, an as a method to do microscopy. But for us now, it's a broader concept. It's an interaction of electrons and light that uh, was uh, uh, basically describing this. This is Javier's work to first crack the theory for that. Um, and only in 2019, this is Ofok Field's work, we, he was actually writing this interaction, what we call PINAM, as a fully quantum optical, in a fully quantum optical manner. And that's because it, until that time, we were not thinking about it as needing to quantize the photon, this, despite the interaction having this nature. And then a few years after, we were also doing the first experiment that needed that uh, the type of interaction. But now, uh, when I, I bring this uh, triangle, quite often people see this edge as well. So what, what is actually the missing, the missing edge? along this line. What will be the interaction between electrons and two-level systems? Because I think where the field is heading next, if you try to predict a few years into the future, is to try to find the first experiment to do that. So first, the, the theory itself, you know, you can write an Hamiltonian of a similar type, but then the proposal for how to do that, so the first one is a work by Avi Gover and Amnon Yariv, this is PRL from 2020, to suggest a semi-classical theory for that interaction. And then in a series of papers that, uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, some by, by our group, some by Shenhui Fan that we had back to back, and, uh, and Javier having contributions here. We were also presenting the full uh, quantum optical theory for that. And that's something that, well, the terminology is still debatable, but it could be called free electron bound electron resonant interaction. We'll see if this name catches or not. <laughs> that's, uh, so now, for uh, what I want to show you is a couple of examples of experiments of where we are heading in, in thinking about this triangle, and I'll First, and mostly focus about this. This is where the most activity is happening in recent years, electron-light interactions. And I think here, the ma main focus, and still the majority of experiments, are dealing in some one way or another in ability to do microscopy in a better manner. So a little bit about the microscopy side of what we can do with electrons. And that's, I think, the, the first example was carbon nanotubes. This is the uh, Ahmed Sewell paper from 2009. It was showing you that you can feel, image the field around a carbon nanotube with a, with a laser light. and that's a, and the, the, only a year after was actually the theory explanations by Javier, by another group from the, the Zewell work, the Zewell group. Um, then uh, the technology went further. There were new also companies coming into the game and new developments in, in tech. This is a carbonic group from APFL showing how you can image sending wave plasmons on a nanoware of silver. And then you know there were many other contributions by other groups. The, 
the place where my group entered into it is in looking into photonic crystal slabs and you, how you can look into block modes trapped in those. It was a back to back with Klaus Roppers. They were looking into whispering gallery modes. So you can see the field of a whispering gallery mode around the sphere. And since then, and you know, in the last uh, years since, we, we have had a, a series of, of contributions, and it's really exploding in how quickly this is now uh, accelerating. This is, for example, uh, when you can look into um, silicon structures that are supporting uh, the acceleration of electrons. Those are called accelerators on chip. And we can look at the field in a three-dimensional manner to capture what's the field inside the channel that's accelerating electrons. Or uh, you can look into polaritons and 2D materials. And in those, this is uh, photon polaritons and some work on, on plasma polaritons. You can look at the dynamics of those polaritons. So this is really becoming a frontier tool for, for microscopy. And, uh, and what uh, I'll do, given time, is I think, let me skip one slide and, and do and, and say something about <coughs> about where where this is standing where right now because I think one one interesting aspect to to ask is well what is the bottleneck in trying to do the best possible microscopy with electrons because the um, when we so far when we want to have the interaction you know, of an electron with some sample give us information and mapping the field there we are very strongly limited by this fact that a laser field has to be pretty strong. You know, it's all about a cross-section in the end. And that means that only samples that can sustain very intense fields will be relevant. In almost all examples so far, we had to use femtosecond pulse lasers, which is also limiting us substantially. It means we also need to synchronize the electron to arrive at the right time when the laser intensity is high. And that means, in terms of the plethora of things you can imagine doing, there is only a small fraction we can actually access. So, now, that, that means we, we want to be able to somehow enhance imaging contrast by several more orders of magnitude to be able to see more. And this is what we were setting to do by the idea that we can modulate the electron, the electron free flow interaction, so basically manipulate its wave packets in some manner to try to get a better imaging uh, method. And that's what I want to show you here. Actually, I'm, I'm really proud of, of this work for another reason. This is the second group of students from my lab that is now in the system. You know, the, for uh, new groups, it's always a challenge to be passing from the first generation, almost al always amazing people, to the next generation. And th this is already work. <coughs> It's my second generation students, like uh, Tomer and Arthur, that are making this uh, happen, and Ron, who is actually here in the conference. Um, so, wh what do we have here? When we look into uh, samples of, pol of polaritons, those are hexagonal boron nitride samples of, uh, that hold the phonon polaritons in them. Okay. Um, actually, what we have here, I need to make a bigger picture of this, is uh, this is the most advanced sample we used for imaging polaritons. This is the work from the Frank Oppens group that we worked with for a couple of years now on some beautiful stuff. It's done by uh, Hanan, who's now a new faculty member in Israel, in bar -Ilan University. So wh what we have here is a, a flake of um, boron nitride that is held on uh, basically like a drum mode. It's tight around a, a circle of vacuum and gold on the sides. What it means, and I hope it will stabilize. <laughs> no, it's just blinking faster and faster. Let's see if it's somewhere. Otherwise, I'll try to explain this without. But uh <laughs> hopefully, let's see. <laughs> So what, what, you can, what we have here is then a circle of boron nitride. It's a perfect flake that is held on the sides by gold. Now, we, when we shine light at it, it can couple from the edges and form some wave that's standing there. What you would imagine intuitively is like a drum mode, basically a standing wave of, uh, of a drum, but it's made from phonon polaritons. Now, what I, except for the interesting dynamics of that wave, what we did here is we used a very weak uh, laser intensity. This is a few watts per centimeter square. So it's a kilovolt per meter, if you want, in electric field strength, which is several orders of magnitude below typical experiments that we do in this field. Um, and what you do when you try to then image it, so you illuminate it with, with light, and you bring the electron through, you look at them, you try to get a mode, that's the image we get. So you can see something is there, but barely anything, and you no, see no features. Now, what you do when you get the same intensity of the sample, but now you pre-modulate the electron. So the electron itself is now modulated, 
in its wave packet before it arrives at the sample. That allows you to enhance the, the imaging technique and get significantly stronger features. So you actually see the standing wave feature, and you see also the phase dynamics. Uh, right? You can see that this is the phase of the field. You can actually scan over it. It's sub-cycle imaging of the way the, phase, the, uh, the field itself oscillates. And you can then see the phase features. And I will talk a bit more about this. And now, what, what this is in, in other areas, you can think about it as coherent amplification. You, can, you need to lock the face of the modulating probe. In this case, it's a coherent probe, the electron, with the face of the signal. And that allows you to extract a significant enhancement. In this case, we calculate about a 20x enhancement in contrast. Now, the, the way to do this is to build on the uh, is to build on the electron, uh, let's see, it's not letting me connect back. OK, otherwise I'll shift it from here. That's, uh, so we are basically building on the electron experiment that we typically have to excite electrons in synchrony with a sample. But we need to bring an additional uh, interferometer into the game. So what allows us to scan over the modulation of the electron with a pre-interaction with it, with the laser, to bring an electron that's already modulated to the sample and then scan over this phase. This phase is the relative cycle arrival time of the electron to the sample. By scanning over this, we get a sequence of images that we can then integrate together. And the actual procedure to go from a sequence of images, none of them is the actual correct image. Each of them is a kind of a projection, like a quadrature of the, of the field. And then by collecting all of them, algorithmically, you can invert the problem at every point and extract both the amplitude and the phase. So the actual proce procedure be behind it, this is actually coming out in Science Advances in a few weeks, is the first, uh, is really the, the algorithm for doing this, and it is the, the key to, you know, the interaction behind the scene is, is strongly nonlinear. And what it allows us to solve, and you can solve that there's a unique solution to it, is to find the amplitude and the phase with a significantly enhanced uh, in a significantly enhanced manner. And I think a lot of what we can do if we think forward about what are the limits now of this technology is going to be using this idea of enhanced measurement. Um, but I think for uh, taking time into consideration, I want to skip forward a bit. I'll just say one more thing in that once using this method, we can, it's not only that we see the face and the amplitude, but we see the entire dynamics of the field. So what you can see here is both the dynamics of the group of the wave packet in, in, in time and, and space. And I'll show you just an example of this. This is data that we collected early October and, and analyzed, and we need to do more about. So what, what you're seeing here is now the dynamics over a longer extent of time. So there is a big flake, and you see those features here. Are, those are vortices. Those are singularities in the film. And what's interesting about them is that some of them also rotate one way and some of them rotate the other way. This is actually exactly the topological charge of each, for, of each one. It's really nice that we can see them this way. And over time, you can see that they, they get closer and they will annihilate with one another. So you can actually see the dynamics of creation, and in this case, annihilation of singularities, because you can see the dynamics, both sub-cycle dynamics, that's why it's rotating, and also the group dynamics over a much longer time. And that's where, how they actually annihilate. Right, so this time, and you see the pale hill will just vanish at the last part, part of the movie. Right, they all get close, and, and now that it's t just gone. Right, and I think this is the type of things that we can we now see, and we can discuss much more on this. But I want to take a, a few minutes to mention something uh, something else that we have done in this context. So th all, everything I showed you so far was the dynamics of phonon polaritons. We, we can also work quite a lot with with uh, surface plasmons. Uh, this is. Uh, work that followed from Javier's theory paper from 2016 of what happens when you have a standing wave surface plasmon and you send an electron through it. And you can image those arrays of vortices. I think that's something pretty nice. But the, the reason we went into this was with an interest of another type. We wanted to see the coherence of the electron. You know, so far we use the coherence of the electron in longitudinal dimension, but you can also sculpture the electron in the transverse dimension. You can shape the electron transversely. And one aspect that happens, you know, when, if, when an electron goes through a sending wave, what would you expect to see? That you can ha have it acting as a, grating, as a grating to change the electron direction. It's like Bragg diffraction from light. So this really cool idea was actually named after interesting people. This is the idea called the Kapitza Dirac effect. And I'll, um, the Kapitza Dirac effect of can you have light uh, cause acting as a grading for electrons. It's an experiment in nature from 20 years ago by Herman Batalan. 
Um, and to do this from surface plasmons is something we were always curious about, this Javier's theory paper from a couple of years ago. And that's what we have here. You can see the diffraction spots, this kind of uh, hexagonal structure, due to the motion of the electron through the vortices. And that proves that you can really manipulate the electron as a coherent creature transversely as well, as longitudinally. So if I uh, take from this one point, it's this idea that we can um, build microscopy concepts now, and much more when the electrons are acting as coherent, both in, uh, in transversely, longitudinally, in time, in space, this kind of a coherent creature to, to play with. And there is much more to, to say about this, and, but uh, I want to then try to explain where, where we see this going now when we have the coherence properties of the, of the electron. Because we, we were talking about this triangle, and we were using the interaction here mostly as an imaging technique, but we can also use the same interaction to create light. Right? We can use this as a source of, uh, of quantum light, for example. And that's something that we're now thinking about quite a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say in, a, in brief that the, one of the motivations for creating quantum light, but not the only one, is for thinking about uh, use of light for quantum information processing applications. You know, the most famous of this, not, maybe not most uh, immediate, is quantum computing. If we have sources of light that are quantum and we can create them in, in a controllable fashion, we can do quite a lot with it. And specifically in the optical regime, there, are still, there is still need for good sources of good quality, both in a rep repetition rate and fidelity of quantum light. The, most, uh, the thing that is slightly less famous, and I see that this is a, hopefully will connect back because it doesn't let me move. It's, uh, maybe the less famous is where do you actually hold, okay, I think I'll just use it like this. Yeah, okay. So what's, I think, less famous about how you store light in a... <laughs> Taking a, a risk here. Hopefully stable. So, okay. What did you do? What did you do to save me before? I have no magic trick. Yeah, it somehow helped, so it was... Okay, let's give it a chance or just uh, cross our fingers. Yeah, I think it's stable. Otherwise we remove this and we change the... Yes, let's try this. Okay. Yes. Okay. So when I, sorry for uh, for the mess with this, but I'll I'll try to use it very carefully without touching the cables, <laughs> and I think it's stable. Okay. So uh, I I was talking about the uh, electron wave packet as a resource now, and I want to see how I use it for the creation and the manipulation of quantum of the light as the, as the output in this case. So we invert the game we played before. If so far we were thinking about the electron as a way to extract information about the light, it can now be the source of features for light. And I think that the one thing that is not super famous about light is where do we store quantum information when we think about light, light states? We need to find a place to put a logical qubit into, into light mode. And that's an interesting, uh, an interesting game that the most famous manner of doing this is if we have individual photons, we can decide on shooting them through one ch channel or another. This is what we think about as the dual rail qubit. And that's, an, of course, a way to encode a qubit on a single photon. But you could do way more than this. You can remember that a photon is actually an entire harmonic oscillator in potential. And that means we can actually store the quantum information on a much larger Hilbert space, on a large, much larger number of photons. And that, that way, we can, for example, create states of light that will be way more complex, they will be made of many, many photons, but are also much more robust to noise. For example, states of light where if you lose a single photon, you can still reconstruct and fix the quantum state you held there. Uh, so if apply error correction intrinsic 
to the electron. This idea of using the entire Hilbert space uh, is what's called continuous variable quantum computing. And the main challenge there is that despite some observations of this in the microwave regime, in Justice on Junctions and in other platforms, uh, it was not so, so far not created to good enough quality in the optical regime. It's very hard to make multiple photon states of light that will be good enough in quality. And that's something that electrons could potentially help with. So what we have as a, as a proposal that we had out uh, in PRX this year is this idea that we can use the electron as a we think about it as the electron qubit. We encode quantum information on the initial electron. We shape its wave packet. We then let it interact with the photonic structure. And that interaction is creating light that is now entangled with the electron. Then later on, by post-selecting on the electron, you can create quantum states of light. And what's, I think, beautiful and really surprising to us is that the most desirable quantum states of light, that, like cat states, this is an example of a four-legged cat state, or what is called the GKP states, the gottesmann kitayev preskill states, are the natural outcome of post-selecting on what are, for us, the simplest types of electrons. The electron combs, the ones that we're now creating in our labs, are actually the outcome of their interaction with, with light will be creating those states that are the most desirable for quantum computing. It's as if nature, in some manner, conspired to help us create those quantum states. And I, I think there is there's really something beautiful about it. Um, now, if I, if I try to imagine where this goes next, and I think I'll I'll not delve into this in too many details, but the, the main challenges that we have these days is how to create good quality electron comps, how to have strong interactions of electrons with, with good quality cavities, to talk about the efficiency of the interaction, and also talk about coincidence uh, measurement for, uh, for heralding. So we need to do the post-selection well, we need to do a good enough interaction with light, and we need to create those electrons to start with. And on all of those fronts, different groups around our community now had contributions uh, that expand this, and uh, I will not go through this in details, but I will say that if you want to hear a bit more about, about this, Ron Ruimi, my student, is giving a talk tomorrow, um, and we are talking there about what it takes to have an electron as a resource for electron interaction with light as a resource, and we're specifically thinking about whether we can extend it to back to the microwave regime and take away from the optical regime, and there are many good reasons to, for doing this. Um, but I'll... And, uh, for, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll say that the, currently the bottleneck for how we actually, uh, whether this will work or not, is in this parameter here. If you think about the strength of interaction between electron and light, whether we can reach a regime where this dimensionless parameter here is approaching unity, will be the, the difference of whether we can make this technology make a difference or not. And on this, there are uh, a couple of recent experimental works um, that. Uh, I'll, I'll say, uh, in brief, this is our collaboration with, uh, with ZJU from China and with Guy Baltal, who's in my department, where we use plasmonic surfaces. And this is today currently the strongest interaction between electron and light. There is up to three um, surface plasmons that are created per electron. Um, problem here is that this is lossy. It's very hard to extract those electrons for use. The second approach that I think is really interesting to follow, this is something that actually Marin Soliacic presented yesterday, is a, a work led for, by his lab. That I was I was part of, of when back when I was a postdoc and it published this year in Nature where you can use this idea of flat bands to enhance and strengthen the interaction between electron and structures to try to get to a regime of single photon per electron. So th I think those are currently two leading approaches for how to do this, but but there are more. Um, but uh, I think uh, I, I skip this, so I have uh, two minutes to talk about something else that I think is is even more ambitious because you know when we think now about electron-light interaction and, uh, and the fundamental strength of interaction there. We need to also try to imagine where this goes, and I think computing is not necessarily the only place. Um, uh, if we think about this triangle that I really built a lot of my talk about, I think one of the interesting questions that uh, we see happening in other areas is when we are not dealing about one particle of each, but about a, this regime of multi-particle interactions. And for example, when we have a, an interaction in, in a traditional uh, light matter interaction between two level system and quantum harmonic oscillators, the scenario of multiparticles here, what, right? What is the interaction that we get in this case? Right? Because a lot of our community is going there. This is like the first steps toward, toward many body physics. And in many body physics, you'll have a large number of particles. This, and in the simplest case for this interaction will be the superradiance of Dicky type superradiance phenomena. Right? And in a similar way, you can ask what happens when an electron, multiple electrons, are now doing an interaction? So actually, this edge is also 
familiar. When you have a many electron state interacting with the quantum harmonic, harmonic oscillator, you also get a superaddance, but this will be called electron superaddance, the type of physics we have in free electron lasers. But wh what about that edge, though? What happens when we think about the electron physics interacting with a many-body system? In a so actually, that is a completely unexplored regime that the first theory works in are some stuff that we were looking into just recently. So uh, if you think about the electron energy loss spectroscopy, but in the super radiant regime, or if you look, think about cathodal luminescence in the super radiant regime, those are the types of physics you can find there. And those are, those are predictions that we're now working to, towards experiments with. But uh, uh, I think there, there is, a, for example, imagine the following uh, realization. You have a surface of, uh, of quantum dots. This, those are, could be arrays of quantum dots, for example, perovskites that we work with, and then an electron can pass by. And that situation is quite unique. This is, unlike light, the same electron particle could, inter could interact and entangle with multiple quantum emitters. So it can be a probe of a non-local type of property of a, of a material. If you have a, a series of emitters and the same electron interacts with all of them, you can basically measure something that will not be a local measurement, but a non-local measurement, something that will interact with the entire array of, of particles. Uh, I think th this is one of the kind of effects that, for example, if you think about superradiance, a regime that still have a, f a phenomenon that still has regimes that we cannot solve because there are many body quantum physics problems, an electron can make measurements on them that we'll not be able to do with light. And I think that this is one of those areas that are of, uh, of great interest when we're moving forward in our field. Um, there is actually uh, a lot more to say, but I think that I'm, I'm running out of time. I'll just uh, say, when one advertisement where the, uh, the electrons, when they interact, are also unique fundamentally from two-level systems in the sense that they tend to interact in a very broad band, broad band manner. Uh, electron interaction is, is typically interacting into a continuum of optical modes, unlike atoms that have a tendency to interact with, with specific, specific frequencies. And that means that the foundations of quantum optics has to be done somewhat differently. We need to think about multi-mode quantum optics in almost every experiment we do in this area, and not uh, single-mode quantum optics. And lucky for us, this idea of doing multi-mode quantum optics is receiving a lot of attention. For example, there are important contributions by the klaus Molmo group in this area. Um, and that actually propelled us to build theories that are having nothing to do with electrons. I think the most important theory contribution that we have in 2023 from um, my lab was within this area, where we were looking into what happens to superradiance, the original one, by Dickey, when you revisit it, but consider the fact that you need to have a uh, continuum of, of optical modes. If you emit into free space, you can actually not really ignore it. And more than this, uh, the question about what is the quantum state that is created in a super radiance, that's a question that Dickey could have asked, and he didn't, maybe because quantum optics was not as developed. Can you make those cat states or GKP states based on super radiance? So that's something that we, we built recently, like basically the quantum optical theory of that. I think it's a fundamental thing that you can say more about, but I'll, I'll not jump into it. I'll just advertise that we have a paper in this direction. It's still an archive, and I highly recommend looking into it. But I think I'll jump uh, and I'll not go into this. I'll just leave it there as uh, something to look into. So spontaneous emission from correlated emitters. This is an example of a theory work that is fundamental, has no electrons in it, but is really inspired by what we have done with, uh, with free electrons. Um, and sorry for the troubles and mess, but I hope it will stay stable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, I have, um, can you hear? Yes. I have uh, well, a number of questions, but just two. Um, when I learned about uh, the z word experiment, I realized it's a very beautiful illustration of uh, Aharonov's weak measurement of the scheme. Because the fine detail in the, uh, in, in the carbon nanotube unit is in the super oscillations in the evanescent light field, mm -hmm. which the electrons then carry away. And they post select those electrons that have uh, accumulated high energy photons from the, from, from the light and therefore contain the fine information and use it for, and use it for, um, uh, for imaging. So it's a beautiful illustration. And my, my, so my first question is, um, is that insight um, embedded in your group and the way you think about these uh, 
The second question is, what about electron spin? <laughs> so first question is on what are the parts of the field that are, that are observed by the electron, like a connection potentially to super oscillations. So if you think about the mathematics of the interaction of the electron with the field, you can, you can model it as a Fourier transform along a certain axis, the axis where the electron is moving, and extracting a certain Fourier component that depends on the electron velocity. And you can show that this Fourier component will not have, is, is actually not in the far field part. Right? It's, a, it's a K component that is too big. Yeah, and the electrons carry it away. So you naturally get to remove the scattered field or the incoming you know, free space part from the near field component. So you get a certain uh, element of the near field component this way, it, it, which is uh, like a relative of, super, of, uh, of uh, some super oscillation behavior. But basically, any evanescent field will be captured this way. But and sometimes not even evanescent. If we take a mirror, this is the simplest configuration, and reflect from it, the boundary will be enough. And that's the simplest scenario you can get. But you need a Fourier component that is with a large K, yes. About the spin, it's an interesting game. But we actually, you can think Klein Gordon here. Um, there is no experiment so far in the optical regime that had the electron spin as of any effect. And that's an, an interesting challenge for trying to break this. John, please. Um, Thank you for a fascinating lecture and the advances in electron physics that have taken place since I last uh, looked at the field. Uh, the early obstacles to doing experiments such as you described today had always been in the past the, how um, tightly you could collimate the electron beam in energy. And the limits in those days were a half an EV. Now, you're clearly doing much better than that. So could you say a few words about how precisely your electron beams are collimated in energy, please. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the, indeed, the fact that electron microscopes made a jump forward in energy resolution is, is significant for us. The energy resolution of an electron microscope of the type we use is around the one electron volt, maybe uh, 0.7 electron volts. It's act although there are now microscopes that can go a factor of 100 better than that, uh, we are still not there because we, we, at least in the set experiments I showed, we don't have to. Let me explain why briefly. So we have the advance of getting to sub-electron volt energy resolution. Remember, this is a 200 kilo electron volt electron and with one electron volt width. So it is pretty monoenergetic already, um, right? That's, uh, I think, an important statement. And it is monoenergetic enough to be able to tell whether it absorbed or emitted a single photon. The reason we can do this is partially the fact that the electron source is so good, partially that the detector is so good. You need to tell apart electrons of 200,000 electron volts to 200,001 200, electron volts. Right? And telling that apart is done through a spectrometer, a magnetic spectrometer, that is splitting electrons, basically going through a field that turns them by 90 degrees. If they are slightly more energetic, they will do a slightly bigger turn. Like the radius will change and they will hit the detector at a different location. So that's this, the electron energy spectrometer is really the tech that they made this possible. And this is thanks to electron microscopy tech that made it, made it able. Now we still do, you're you expecting us to do better because we talk about phonon polaritons. They are a fraction of an electron volt away from one another. We managed to do those because the laser allows us to stimulate the process, not because of the energy resolution. So there, are, there is actually another trick in our sleeve that is newer, and that's the fact that the, electron la the laser itself stimulates a certain process, yes. even when it's under our resolution. It's thank, you, thank you. Even more clever than I thought. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe we can have final question while uh, Roman prepares. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, thanks for, for the talk. Um, how do you actually measure uh, a GKP state from spontaneous emission? Hmm. That's, a, that's an interesting challenge because typically to measure quantum states with you know, Wigner functions, you need to do some type of homodyne detection. Homodyne detection means you need to have a reference. Where is the reference coming from in spontaneous emission? You'd imagine spontaneous being completely random, but it's not completely random. Remember, you had to modulate the electron to shape its wave packets. The same laser that was shaping the electron to start with is our reference to lock the process, to give you an absolute phase. So you have a laser that's modulating the electron, and you use that as the uh, reference or the local oscillator in the homodyne detection of the output. So despite going through spontaneous emission, it is possible. And that's an interesting game. Thanks.
Thank you so much, and uh, let's really thank you for this wonderful talk.